<clears throat> and a good Friday morning to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your morning to be here with us for what we like to call an hour of power, the Preterist Power Hour, a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. We also make mention of our blog. Uh, it's because we provide updates through it regularly. So I want to encourage you to also just make a tab, a favorite tab, if you will, of powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. And uh, our goal is to provide clarity, healing, and strategy in regards to the power and progress of preterism. Uh, I thank those of you, of course, that are here live with me. And, uh, you know, we have uh, our, one of our directors for the Power of Preterism Network, Edward Howell, with us. We have uh, Zach, uh, you know, our, our, he's been here. He's one of our resident Preterist uh, Power Hour, um, you know, participants, and also Dallas, uh, who has been with us for uh, a good amount of this study here through Genesis, and that's been exciting. Of course, Dallas is the host of um, Better Understanding the Bible on YouTube, so uh, I encourage you to uh, go over there, subscribe watch his videos and be blessed by uh, what he brings forth as well. So I'm Mike Miano. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network. And uh, I also serve as the pastor here at the Blue Point Bible Church, as well as the apologist through a ministry titled MGW Apologetics, Miano Gone Wild, based upon, you know, gaining a zeal empowered by knowledge, being excited to learn and learn new things, challenge your mind, stretch your mind, have conversation with those that you might not necessarily agree with, that's been my sort of hermeneutic, my apologetic for years. And I'm glad that I have such privilege to participate in that. And obviously that takes people that would come together. So that's my uh, second reason and explanation for being so appreciative that you're here for uh, this study this morning. Let's go ahead and uh, turn our attention to the Lord open with a moment of prayer. And then we will move right in on some announcements, some thoughts, a flashback Friday, flash forward Friday, you know, again, uh, reflecting upon what we know and reflecting upon what to do with it, how we might flash forward in our use of a good hermeneutic. So let's pray and we'll get into that. Mighty God, we do thank you. We praise you for the opportunity to gather online. We thank you for the opportunity to um, learn new things, Lord, to have your spirit that helps us be spiritually discerned. Uh, Lord, we praise you for our identity. We thank you for who we are in you, Lord. We thank you for the clothing you've provided, that we are clothed with Christ. And uh, when you look at us, you don't see sinful creatures. You don't see those that are prone to lean upon their own understanding, but rather you see righteous. You see those that desire to glorify you, Lord, because of your work and your work alone. We thank you. We praise you. We ask that you go before us in our study and receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I went ahead and wrote a bunch of notes to share this morning so that I could put together all my thoughts. Uh, again, I want to mention, I mentioned this in the back room, I went ahead and uh, put together my renew and review, or I say that wrong every year, it it's sort of like shop and stop. Uh, I call it shop and stop, I think it's stop and shop. I always get it wrong. If you're here in New York and you know the, the supermarket, uh, you'd, you'd laugh every time I say it. Anyway, I went ahead and did a review and renew for 2022. Neat little rhyme there. And uh, what I did was I reevaluated re my year. I looked at my blogs. I looked at my social media posts. Uh, this is my way of walking worthy of a self-examination at the beginning of every year. Obviously, a great way to prepare for uh, different meetings that we have. We have the uh, Power of Preterism Network's annual meeting coming up. Uh, matter of fact, if I might look at my calendar and let you know the specific date, the Power of Preterism Network's annual meeting. If you have a calendar, I encourage you to write this in there and join with us. This is open to all, uh, 7.30 p.m. on the 20th. And our goal there is to allow some time between our board of directors. Uh, we also uh, talk about goals. Again, clarity, healing, and strategy uh, regarding the power and progress of preterism. Uh, we have a variety of ministries. The, power, the, the Preterist Power Hour is one of those ministries. We also have the Preterist Pastors Network, we have Team Preterist, we have uh, Reformation Now. These are different ministries that have been provided. Uh, Edward maintains a blog, uh, Thinking Through Theology, edhowell.wordpress.com. And um, 
you know, Jonathan Buttry, of course, serves as the pastor there at Holston PBU Church in Rogersville, Tennessee, and he maintains a network of churches as well. So uh, this is a time for us to gather together and then talk with those of you that are involved with our network. Our network, while sometimes our attendance here for our sessions is small, uh, we have a wide network of those that participate through email or social media. Uh, so we try to bring all those thoughts together for the annual meeting and strategize toward some of the efforts uh, that we have ahead. Uh, I know that for myself, I can say that I want to see more preterist churches started and planted and united, uh, whether they're house churches, institutional churches, meeting groups, whatever it might be, uh, I want to see more of that. Uh, so I'm calling it plant preterist churches, uh, my vision for our network. And of course, you'll get to hear from our other board of directors at that annual meeting as well. So January 20th, 7.30 p.m., be there or be square, as the phrase goes. Uh, you know, and um, another thing that I'm looking forward to before I bring us in on our wandering into the garden, our main session, our main discussion that we've been uh, in uh, for the fall season, obviously here we are in the winter, still continuing that. I'm pretty sure that's how Genesis conversations tend to go. They always go beyond what you, you, know, you, you intended when you went to the study. Let's face it, even if you've ever been to a Bible study in person, I guarantee it, go to a Bible study. This is a good challenge. Go to a Bible study uh, about Genesis and find out if it's true that it will go beyond what they said it was going to go beyond at that meeting. You'll see it every time. And that's just the way Genesis works. Why? Because it's rich. It's so full of important details, uh, so full of areas of conversation and perspective. So I've been blessed by this time. I hope that you have as well. Uh, we've highlighted so many resources from uh, the beginning of October there uh, up till now. So I encourage you to just go over to our blog, uh, find, you know, go back to go over to the YouTube channel and review these sessions and uh, you'll be blessed, you know, as you continue to study through Genesis. So um, we are going to move toward in the weeks to come, ultimately by the end of January, uh, we're going to go back to focusing on debate review. If you remember, we had uh, initially started looking at debates began back in 2012, uh, Don Preston and Joel McDermott. Uh, Don Preston and Steve Gregg, we talked about those two debates, and uh, some of you know that I have debates that began those years as well, the Defiance Conference in 2012, um, I debated Sam Frost in 2013, so we're going to go back to reviewing some of those debates and seeing what points need to be highlighted to further the preterist hermeneutic and help people get better clarity uh, into these details of the scripture. So I look forward to that, and then of course interviews, we always try to sprinkle in some neat interviews. Uh, there's been some good books written, uh, books that at least they, they sound good. I've listened to podcasts talking about them. I've read posts. I have not had opportunity to read Daniel Rogers' book. I had not had, I had opportunity to read uh, Pete and um, Rachel Rue's book. I have not had opportunity to read uh, Don Preston's new book. So there's some great stuff out there. And then there's also other resources, uh, preteristpapers.com, a new resource that uh, I had come across. Uh, I encourage you to go ahead and visit that. Um, the Boroughs of Berea, we're going to actually welcome Rick Welch, Rick Welch, excuse me, uh, to our program and interview him and, and talk with him about the podcast, about his testimony. And, uh, you know, we have some exciting things ahead. So I look forward to that. Um, many of you know that I've been talking about on social media, Predergate, Predergate 2022-2023. And, uh, you know, I've been posting about it just to be funny and, you know, um, I said, it's a great time to be alive, Predergate 2023. And, uh, you know, this sparked some conversation and people talking about preterism and talking against preterism, if you will. And that's exactly it. Uh, one brother that was that listens to our podcast, he went ahead and asked me, uh, what is Predergate? And that was great because it gave me opportunity to explain. And I simply said that uh, actually, if you'll bear with me, I'll share it the exact way I said it. That way you can understand when you hear me saying this phrase or see me sharing this phrase, uh, you can understand directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak, uh, what Predergate 2022-2023 means. Bear with me one moment here. If you're on Facebook, you know I share quite a bit of resources, so um, I encourage you to go ahead and check some of them out. So here I wrote, Predergate is a semi-humorous phrase to highlight the scandal that full preterism is demonstrating in contemporary Christianity. 
the scandal of those avoiding the truth of fulfilled Bible prophecy and those working against it. It's a great time to see the heyday of full preterism being demonstrated. Quote, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Acts chapter 5, verse 39. That's Pretergate. That's what I mean when I'm saying it. I'm just glad to see that full preterism is, is wrecking some people's world. And if, you know, you've died to yourself, if you appreciate repentance, you know the wrecking of your world is a beautiful thing. Sometimes it might seem like everything's out of place and you need to find order. Uh, and we're glad to see that the fulfilled Bible prophecy helps you do that, helps you put things in their right place. So that's what I mean there. Um, you know, some resources that I'm currently going through and working on would be uh, Steve Gregg recently wrote a book called uh, Why Not Full Preterism? And uh, I'm, go I'm reading through the book and uh, it seems as though he's bolstering the same confusion he did back in 2012 uh, in a new book. Uh, so why are we writing about the same things that we have video footage of you not being able to respond to uh, in regards to this futurist view, a partial preterist view, if you will. And uh, that was my goal for reviewing the book to see if he has actually responded with clarity to the things he seemed confused about in that debate 10 years ago. So uh, I encourage you get it, you know, if you get a chance, purchase the book and you can follow along in the review we'll be doing in the near future. Um, I'm personally writing a book uh, that will be published in March of 2023 called Full Preterism, Proclaiming the Presence and Purpose of God. And that will help you understand this fulfilled Bible prophecy uh, understanding, and I'll, I'll deal with some of the uh, arguments that have been made against preterism, and hopefully with simplicity and clarity, uh, help you understand the beauty of fulfilled Bible prophecy and full preterism. So, uh, and also give you a foundation uh, to build upon and prayerfully live kingdom life based upon what Jesus has fulfilled. That's what we're saying. That's the beauty of all of this, uh, that you would further appreciate that all things have been given to you pertaining to life and godliness. So, Look forward to that book. Uh, some of you know that I've been talking about the boroughs of Berea. I mentioned Rick Welch before. Um, I had opportunity to join with them last week in Asheville, North Carolina, and um, my testimony was uploaded just yesterday. So if you go over to boroughsofberea.com, uh, they're available on Apple Podcasts. They're available on Spotify. Uh, if you go over there, you can listen to the podcast that was just offered up on Thursday. <laughs> Uh, my testimony. So I do encourage you to do so. I got into other details about um, graciousness and uh, being apologetic and being open, you know, to a conversation with those that you might disagree with and how we might further help others understand preterism by a good attitude, a gracious attitude. And um, so I encourage you to go ahead and visit that. Also, if you go to the Tuesday podcast, you can listen to the discussion we had on Ruth on the boroughs of Berea.com as well. So I encourage you to go over there. Uh, you'll be blessed to listen to the podcast and the different insights and the humor uh, that is brought forth. And uh, some other things, again, there's a lot happening in the preterist world. Um, the Kingdom Bible, the Kingdom Bible uh, it was a, a Bible edition, if you will, uh, based upon the New King James uh, that was offered up. I believe it was the New King James. Uh, however, they may have used a couple different uh, translations to put together this uh, preterist Bible, if you will. It's rather big. Um, some of you know they call it the big Bible. You know, it's huge. Uh, I don't have the copy here, but it's a big Bible. And um, that being said, uh, they've decided to go ahead and put it online. So you can actually find the Kingdom Bible now online. And some of you know I participated in the commentary there uh, for the Book of Kings. And that's now being made available to you online. And of course, in October of this year, I'll be publishing a commentary on the Book of Kings, uh, Kingdom Kings, an application. Well, I always say it wrong. Kingdom Kings, a contextual and applicational study through the Book of Kings. So uh, you'll be blessed to uh, read that, hopefully, and uh, obtain that. So look forward to that. And those are the announcements that I have uh, for you this morning. So if you're on social media, you know there's a lot going on. And uh, if you're not on social media, you probably know that there's a lot going on even in real life, in, in local churches, in uh, the YouTube world, if you will, uh, all over the place. So um, on uh, what are some of these apps? Clubhouse, um, Discord, you know, there's some great conversations happening across all these different platforms. So 
Um, you know, I think that's uh, to the glory of God. I know that's to the glory of God. So we've been wandering into the garden. And I mentioned, uh, if you go over to powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, uh, you could avail yourself the opportunity to see our outline here for uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, wandering into the garden. Uh, back on December 16th, we began looking. We had another podcast on the 2nd of this year and then the 9th, uh, which was Monday. And now here we are with this session. So this is further looking at what we're seeing here in, let's say, Genesis 2-5 uh, through chapter, through verse 25, excuse me. And uh, that's what we've been doing. And as I've mentioned, uh, my idea on this is when I wander into a garden, I begin to look around. And if you follow, actually, if you follow me on social media, you know, I go hiking, I, I go into gardens, I, I do these things. So um, I'm not speaking just to, to say it. This is a, a true hermeneutic. Uh, you know, I go into the garden, I look around. Uh, if you're allowed to touch things, you touch things. You know, if you're allowed to eat things, you eat things. If you're not allowed to eat things, you don't eat them. It seems like a true principle. Uh, however, uh, you know, that's what you're supposed to do, you, you know, and, and wander in there and appreciate the garden. So that's what I hope we've been doing for you. Uh, that's what I hope our blog and our resources do for you. So go ahead, visit our blog site, and you will see uh, some of these important resources. You know, uh, to borrow some thoughts, uh, Sam Frost, I mentioned I debated him. I've actually debated him twice in 2013 and 2019. And um, Sam Frost said, you can never lose sight of Genesis. So for those of you, the preterists that might be following along in our study here and are saying, why is this the preterist power hour? And they've spent so much time, so much time here in Genesis. They, those folks do exist. You know who you are. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and I don't mean that in a mean way, because again, uh, you know, I, I understand we, we have a sort of idea for our program here and what people expect. However, look, Sam Frost even said it. You know, we've said it as well, but Sam Frost said, uh, you know, you, you can never lose sight of Genesis. Uh, furthermore, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., again, you know, his day is coming up. It's uh, noted as a day of service here in the United States. Uh, there's a whole conversation that can go around that. Uh, I think most people think it's a holiday or it's a day to kick back and watch some movies. Uh, no, it's intended to be a day of service, uh, to serve your fellow man and to honor the, uh, the you know, uh, what has been said to be the identity of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his, his good uh, influence in our society. I know some that are saying, you know, all the thinking already all the bad influence he might have had, uh, failing to note their own bad influences in their own life and in this world as well. So give grace, folks. Uh, judge others by the, the, the uh, judgment you'd like to receive. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had said uh, in regards to the Old Testament, one must consider the Old Testament in relation to all civilizations of the ancient Near East. He also further asserted, it is my opinion that biblical criticism and biblical archaeology will serve to justify the position of the church in modern culture, especially in the face of modern youth who are taught to weigh and consider. And then, of course, Walter Brueggemann, who has been mentioned before on our podcast as a great resource, he said, God's act of creation consists of imposition of order upon the mass of undifferentiated chaos. And is it not beautiful? to see the, the beauty of God, uh, you know, the order of God taking place uh, right from Genesis chapter one. And I believe it's so important to see that and to uh, gain an understanding of that. There's a whole bunch more thoughts that you could find if you visit Wandering the Garden, uh, a bunch of things that we talked about even on our last podcast, uh, you know, bringing our thoughts back to the last podcast. Um, we talked through uh, this sort of priesthood picture that we see in Genesis chapter 2. Dallas had really give it give a, a great outline bringing us to uh, citations or uh, other correlations in the scriptures uh, and I know I was blessed I wrote some notes you can for that matter you can look forward to my notes uh, to be updated on the wandering the garden if this is not further enticement uh, to get you to go over to that blog um, I'm going to put my notes up from that discussion so uh, it will bring your thoughts back I know I left that discussion thinking that Genesis 1 through 3 is a beautiful picture of the kingdom and priesthood of God. And I even have it circled and starred and with asterisks next to it right here in my notes. Uh, you know, again, you see the dominion mandate. You see the naming of things. Uh, this is a picture of a king. That's what a king does. Uh, then you have priests, this picture of, of Adam and the garden and Eve uh, and, and the, the, the bone language and uh, much of what, again, 
uh, Dallas had brought up on our last podcast really blessed me and left me, uh, you know, really praising God for uh, this beautiful picture. And even as we wandered into the New Testament and saw language about, you know, the helper, we saw language about God's breathing, his spirit, and uh, the body being the temple. And, and, you know, just, again, such beautiful imagery. And I hope that, you know, you're, you're relishing this clarity of, of a con and consistency of a picture of God's kingdom, God's government, God's priesthood, uh, as you're journeying with us through these things. So um, in my current study, I'm still going through Tim Martin's uh, sermon series as well, uh, kind of bouncing back and forth between uh, the days of Genesis, following along with Dallas on better understanding the Bible, and then, uh, you know, surveying the garden, God's garden with Tim Martin on timmartinteaches.wordpress.com. And uh, I'm up to number five, uh, you know, uh, doing a very slow and back and forth review. Uh, however, Tim really has been blessing me with, uh, he said in his most recent video that I'm watching, everything in the garden is prophetic of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why this is such important details uh, for us to be looking at. Um, he gave some great insights about covenant life and salvation, how this is the overall theme. And, uh, you know, something about preterism, something about the faithfulness of God that really stood out to me as well was what Tim said about how are we going to get the world to believe it if we don't believe it? And, you know, there's so many thoughts. Uh, those of you that follow my ministry know that uh, that's a big contention of mine. Uh, how are we going to get the world to believe that Bible study is important if we're not studying our Bibles? How are we going to get the world to believe that the details of Genesis are important if we're not studying them out? How are we going to get the world to believe that the kingdom of God is a reality right now, despite hardship, despite trials, and yet we don't believe that? How are we going to get the world to trust Christ and his faithfulness? And that he means what he says and does what he says when he will, if we don't believe it. You see the, you see the dilemma uh, that, that should cause. Uh, you know, many know that I would say, how are we going to get the world to see the power of the church if we don't believe it? You know, uh, if, how are we going to get the world to believe good news if all we talk about is bad news? <laughs> we don't believe the good news. Uh, you know, there's just so much that needs to be talked about uh, and, and understood if we're going to talk about it and try to help the world understand it. So before I start preaching a sermon, folks, I'm going to double back here. Uh, so the gospel is the garden, though. You know, that's a quote from Tim Martin. You know, the gospel is the garden. So I hope that that's, you know, I'm excited that this is what's being provoked as I'm studying through this and thinking through these things. And I hope for you as well. One last thing I'll say before I uh, bring us in on our study here and open up some mics for discussion. Uh, and then my goal for today would be that we would um, we, we did talk a lot about this picture of the bone and the rib and, and Eve, and I appreciate that, Dallas, that you, you highlighted that. I'm hoping that we'll, we'll journey further on that discussion, uh, gain some clarity about what we're saying, and um, then also journey toward the end of Genesis 2, where we read this phrase about uh, the, you know, the naked and unashamed. I know we had brought up some um, possible different perspectives uh, in that, uh, so I'd love to hear where we're going with that. And then let's wander into Genesis 3 a bit, make some notes, and then next week we'll look at Genesis 3 through uh, 4 in depth. Uh, of course, bringing up a host of resources. I have quite a few Don Preston videos that are already coming to mind uh, where Don's dealt with the curse and different studies that he's highlighted, the curse of Genesis 3. Um, however, there's a lot more than just the curse, as I was even just doing some preliminary study this morning. Um, seeing that there's more to Genesis 3 than just talking about the curse. There's a lot that needs to be said. Uh, one last thought here. This is a quote from G.K. Beale. I found it so insightful. Uh, not only did I share this quote on social media five years ago to the day, uh, January 13th, 2018, um, it, it fits with our discussion. So I was like, wow, that, that's like beautiful and needs to be shared. We have seen in our discussion of Genesis that Adam's commission in Genesis 1 was to be carried out by his serving in the Edenic temple, managing it in an orderly manner and expanding its boundaries. In fact, we have seen that the reapplication of Adam's commission to Noah, the patriarchs, Israel, and end-timed Israel was also inextricably linked to the beginning of building temples and expanding them. Therefore, it should not surprise, surprise us that Christ also initiates the building of a new temple, 
once again, performing the duties that the first Adam failed in executing. At various parts in the, in the Gospels, Christ indicates that the old temple is becoming obsolete, and he is replacing it with a new one. And that's a quote from G.K. Beale, uh, The Temple and the Church's Mission. I mean, how beautiful. <laughs> I was like, man, that's, you know, this is a guy that's widely respected in the theological world. And he sees, again, we might not all say it the exact way he said it and might not harp on other, the same points he's harping on. However, you, you know, here he sees the significance of what's going on in Genesis. And that's been sort of my heart. Uh, you know, you might not agree on all the details, but if you can get the significance of what's going on in Genesis and what it's saying about covenant life, what it's saying about salvation, uh, and what Christ truly accomplished for his people, you know, I'll shake your hand and say, hey, good discussion and good disagreement, you know, if that's the way it needs to go. But if you could just get the significance. So um, I hope that those of you that are here share the same. I'm going to go ahead and begin unmuting mics, and we will continue our discussion here, wandering around the garden. Let me know if you have any thoughts about things I just mentioned. And of course, let's continue talking a bit more about what we talked about last week with the rib and Eve, and being the helper, and then, of course, we'll wander into this uh, last part here of Genesis 2, uh, chapter, verse 25. If you're unmuted, jump on in. Okay, I just would like to <clears throat> share, like, what Dallas was talking about, about the rib and the helper, and that uh, uh, Eve coming from the 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 tribe or the uh, Adamites, uh, uh, Adam's people, because the beasts of the field, those nations were unsuitable. So he had to find a suitable uh, uh, mate through his people. And, uh, and how he had used, I think in demonstration with uh, Abraham uh, finding a, a suitable mate for, let me see, uh, Jacob, I believe, or one of them, one of his sons, uh, and they had used that phrase bone, bone of his bone. So he got, uh, he sent, uh, I guess his servant to his people to find a suitable mate. So, <clears throat> and then when he had spoke about uh, um, us being the temple of God, having the Holy Spirit dwelt within us and that how we're unified and become one with the spirit and how we're the helper. So we're the helper as in, in a form of we're married to Christ, being the bride of Christ, the church, you know, and that's how I kind of correlated it. Well, that sounded good to me. Uh, Dallas, was there anything Edward said that maybe you wanted to respond to or uh, any thoughts you want to bring up? I think that's absolutely bang on. We saw the natural taking place with Adam set up with a physical priest and a physical priesthood, and then the transfer into the new covenant where now we're the spiritual filled people being empowered by God made one with Jesus through that marriage, which is pretty fascinating because Jesus was made one with God, which makes us one with God through spirit. So there's a, the natural is a nice picture but when we look at the suitable helper, the one thing I would add to what Ed's saying is to punctuate it is how it's evolved into a better helper. We're no longer a suitable helper. We are the better helper in Christ. So it's a, it's a great study. I, I really loved it. And I think Ed got, it, got that bang on. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. And, and Dallas, if I might ask, where are you currently at? Uh, have you produced any uh, new videos since we've last talked on Monday? Uh, where are you currently at in your study uh, right now on your channel? Uh, what I'm starting to do, I haven't added a, uh, anything because my uh, these topics are getting so big. So it's taking me a couple weeks now to put uh, ideas together in a coherent way that is one thing I'm starting to really kind of understand in these presentations is you have to speak from a foundation that nobody knows anything. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it a, a little bit longer, but I think it makes the videos better. So I'm still working on putting together uh, naked and afraid for a, more of an exhaustive look at it as opposed to just what I would do as a presentation and then uh, moving into Genesis 3 and breaking it down so that we can see it more of I think in general we've seen very good coverage from a philosophical theological uh, way of looking at Genesis where I'm looking at it more what does this language blend with the natural 
why does this look real instead of you know that what is this prophecy prophecy language drawing so taking it away from the image and bringing it and mixing it to the natural so that's what i'm working on all right good deal hey that's uh, enticing to bring us over to your channel there um and you know i'm glad that we're kind of in the same place you, you know in a lot of this stuff I, I think that we're all kind of moving toward genesis 3 which is neat um and then obviously uh when i do our cutoff at the end of the month we're just gonna have to send folks over to dallas so he's hopefully he's still in genesis folk and uh, you can uh follow along as he's diving deeper into uh you know some of those details uh beyond let's say genesis 5 uh, and forward so I have done an outline up to Genesis 17, and oh. now I'm starting to unpack them all. So we'll be there for a while. <laughs> there you go, folks. That's that's pretty, <laughs> um, you know, just because we're not talking about it here on our session doesn't mean that many of us probably won't be following behind the scenes uh, to further study. I know, actually, I can speak for some of us that we will. So uh, thank you, Dallas, for your, your continued labor in that regard. Um, I know last session, I, I did want to uh, bring up Vicky. Uh, Vicky, I know out of all of us, you were the only one that did not have ample opportunity if you chose to uh, share any thoughts. So I did want to uh, open up and, and give you opportunity to share with us maybe where you're at in the study of Genesis. Uh, if there's anything that you feel we've highlighted well, or maybe we have not highlighted well, um, let us know. And of course you don't have to join in, but let us know where you're at, Vicky. Oh, I'm just listening and, and uh, trying to understand. Okay. Uh, so do things, would, would you mind if I just ask you a couple questions? Yes. So. No, no, uh, no, you can. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, so in, as we're studying Genesis, uh, are you seeing the, the picture of covenant and the focus on, let's say, uh, Adam as someone who has rule over the garden? and maybe responsibility for the church, for the people of God to be responsible over yes. the garden. Can you see that picture? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you see the problem with interpreting Genesis in a, let's say, a, a hyper-literal fashion where it becomes, you know, uh, you know, have you seen some of those examples? Have you moved away from looking at Genesis in, in a physical way? Uh, I... I have to say that my knowledge is not very, very deep. Okay. And, uh, and also, I have certain practicality. Like, I don't go to so many things, so many things so deep, so in detail, that mm -hmm. sometimes I lose what is, you know, there's a saying, don't major on the minor, but there is nothing minor in God in the bible also well said amen there, yeah there is that, that that sort of picture of balance where we're not going to obsess about things that might be a little bit beyond where we're at you know again i think we all share this that god reveals these yeah. truths to us when he desires to reveal them to us so yeah we can be gracious in our discussion and kind of follow the spirit in our study and uh, i yeah. appreciate you for following along vicky that was okay a good that was a great question, Pastor, about about the covenant and about Adam uh, and dominion and things of this nature. Because <clears throat> with my presuppositional thoughts, I was always taught Adam was the first man biologically, and you know he was just to tend the garden like like a uh, a gardener mm -hmm. instead of him uh, having covenant with God. Him. Um, being a chosen people out of chaos, out of nothing, of other peoples, and brought and placed in the garden, you know, and given like uh, God's uh, uh, image to where, you know, he could be a representative of God to those that are around him, the other nations, you know, and peoples. Uh, I've never, you know, looked at it in that, in that way. Um, and, and it was very helpful, you know, that he was a first, he was a covenant man, you That's know. Right. Amen. There is, there is such beauty and application to a lot of the details that we're seeing. It's not just great Bible study. You know, there's, there's this beautiful story that we're finding in scripture uh, that begins with rightly understanding Genesis. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I might share this, um, 
one of the things I did following our discussion <laughs> on Monday was I went ahead and read that chapter I had mentioned, chapter 15 of uh, Beyond Creation Science. And I just wanted to share some points that I believe reflect exactly where we're at in our study of Genesis 2. And uh, some I was blessed by them. So uh, in that portion there, uh, talking about you know, the Eve, Eve, the rib, et cetera, uh, you know, and, and Adam, the Christ, uh, they said this. The structure of Revelation is designed to reflect the created order of Genesis 2, man first, then woman. This should not surprise us because Jesus presented himself as the bridegroom during his ministry. Matthew 9, 15, 25, 1 through 13, John 3, verses 27 through 30. The imagery of Jesus Christ as the bridegroom in the church as the bride, Ephesians 5, 26 through 27, and Revelation 19, 7, is a prominent teaching in the New Testament. Paul sees much more in Genesis than mere history. The many New Testament references to Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride, are all rooted in the prophetic nature of Genesis 2. Now, I do know that some people get, you know, I know someone had commented on our social media, and I always value, I value the diversity of perspective. You know, I, I want to say that. Um, and they had said that the church is not the bride, that the new Jerusalem was the bride, uh, and that the church is not the new Jerusalem. You know, I think there's a lot going on, uh, you know, in, in the text. Uh, and I think there's a lot that people, a lot of different perspectives uh, that come to mind when we bring up the phrase church, or when we bring up bride, marriage, mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot that goes into almost every word we bring up. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate the opinion there um, and the perspective. Um, I do take the view, uh, as Brother Ward Fenley has often taught, that, you know, that we, we can get lost if we start being very demanding of these texts and limited in our way that we're understanding phrases. Um, so I do take the view that the New Jerusalem, the bride, the church, uh, these are synonyms, if you will, uh, for the beauty of God's people. Uh, in the future of God's people. Uh, so, uh, you know, if your hermeneutic rubs against that, that's fine. Uh, I disagree. And, uh, you know, that's sort of where I find myself in my study, um, especially when the understanding, you know, dare I say, starts to sound like a, another variant of ide idea, ideas, excuse me. Uh, let's say if it leans toward uh, Hebrew Israelitism, if it leans toward Israel only, if it leads toward Mormonism, Islam, <laughs> you know, if you start going down, if your view starts to lean into these perspectives, I kind of wave a, I'll say a white flag, you know, I won't even say a red flag. I'll just, hey, hey, I want peace. You can see <clears throat> that over there, uh, you know, so I just wanted to say that because I believe there's a lot that can be said about the terms uh, and different variants that people get into. And if you listen to my testimony on Burroughs of Berea, you know that I'm in a season of graciousness. So I say, hey, that's great. Uh, however, there's a venue for that, and uh, please stick to that venue. This is not it. So uh, that being said, um, uh, you know, I'm really blessed by where we're at, and uh, I appreciate Tim Martin and his thoughts, um, even as I sit here and I look at notes from his, uh, his teachings that I've just been listening to, um, and I appreciate Beyond Creation Science. So I, I thought those were some great quotes from the book, uh, despite some folks maybe commenting on the post disagreeing. Um, I thought that they made salient points. Um, I know Zach, you're here as well, and Zach's been a great part of our study as well. I did want to give opportunity uh, for you to respond to anything that we've been talking about, or uh, even the quotes I just shared, you know, from Beyond Creation Science, or anything for that matter. Hey, good morning. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, when we went through Genesis 1, we talked about it being a temple text and we looked very deeply into that. And now we're moving into Genesis two and we we seem to be um, with the marriage of Adam and Eve, we seem to getting to the, we're at the sort of the climax of the first movement of the story of Adam and Eve. Um, do you, wh where is the temple in this text? Is this a, would you describe this as somehow a temple text too? Um, are we moving into a different theme 
um, yeah, how, how to how to how do Genesis one and Genesis two, you know, relate to each other on that level? I appreciate that. That's a good question. Uh, if I might respond, and I, I welcome others to uh, add, add their thoughts. For me, uh, what I see happening is the temple was created, and then the image is created and put in the temple. So there becomes a yes, a different movement, if you will, to borrow that phrase. Um, and so now we're moving into decoration. Temple's been dedicated. It's been built. It's been dedicated, and now we're decorating it. To you know, use I, I wrote a blog about this recently, um, and that's what I believe is happening now in Genesis two. Is it's sort of the decoration of the temple. So I believe the temple uh, is the. You know, it, it becomes tricky. That that's why I guess I said what I said before about the bride, the temple. Um, I believe that the temple is the what God is doing. It's the picture of God's work. Uh, so, you know, again, we see the same thing with the uh, temple the Jews had in Jerusalem. Josephus describes it as, a, you know, the garden imagery, and it's a place where God was at work. So I believe that's what we're seeing in Genesis 1, was this picture of God's work. And then with the creation of Adam and Eve, I believe that this is a picture of the, you know, now you're, you're peering into the temple and you're seeing the work that's going on in the temple. So you're seeing the, 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 the man, the, the dominion of God. You're seeing the uh, priesthood work of God, uh, which we kind of highlighted with Eve and a lot of that imagery. So that's what, that's how I would explain that. I believe that we're seeing kingdom, uh, you know, the king uh, with Adam and we're seeing the priesthood with Eve, uh, the work in the temple, uh, the presence of God. Uh, that, does that respond to your question, Zach? Yeah, I mean that that's a response. Um yeah, I think I'll I'll move back from that. I am interested in talking about a little bit about the the um being naked and unashamed part, but I don't know if we're there yet. Well, yeah, I'm I'm definitely ready to move in on that. Uh unless I'll I wouldn't mind responding to the question you put forward if you wouldn't mind. Is that cool? Oh, yeah. Uh, what I see is taking place, which is a very big thing that if we take a step back and look at this, that the covenant template of Genesis one would have been a separate tablet on its own. So when Moses compiled these uh, parchments, I think that, you know, whatever form they were in to create this, we're seeing the end of one legal document, the covenant template. Then when we move to uh, Adam, what we're seeing is a purposefully chosen piece of localized history among all of the Mesopotamians who knew the story of Adam, and they were purposefully choosing that to claim their stake for the right to the inheritance of Adam's kingdom. So what we're reading is a, if you take a look at the book of Revelation, it's written in a, uh, two languages, covenant terms, and then the natural events that were going on at the time that those covenant terms were governing. So what I believe we're reading in Genesis 2 now is that same, same with Genesis 2, 3, uh, up to Noah even, uh, it's that Revelation covenant language depicting the natural events of these people that the uh, that Moses is claiming they have a hereditary right to claim that kingdom through. So I see them as two independent documents that, as far as a temple text is concerned, they are now being forged together because they're using the one to claim the other. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm getting that, that document that... Uh, uh, of, of right of succession as far as, you know, Adam being that where um, Israel had come out of uh, and Moses uh, claiming uh, that uh, hereditary garden uh, uh, um, inheritance to whereas that was their hope, you know, that Eventually, with uh, through Jesus Christ, um, we we were able to return to that through the uh, restoration, and we're currently living in it. <laughs> yes, exactly, and it was their claim. So, to me, that's that two documents. That's Moses actually taking the history of Mesopotamia and merging it with that 
contemporary people making both the covenant template and the law a uh, temple text. So I believe that the first temple text of the covenant document could have actually been in probably other cultures as well. But now what we're seeing here, and I, I really appreciate this question because it should bring in a lot of cultural relevance and significance to why Adam was included in the Bible. So to me, that's a really good question. It might not have been in the direction that you were asking, but that's what came to mind when you brought that up. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, if I might respond to that briefly, I would just say that, you know, going back to Genesis 1, one of the things that I had said for my hermeneutic, right, I had marked out about five different ways of looking at Genesis 1 and what's ultimately being said. Um, we talked about the temple text. So again, uh, for me, that's a liturgical perspective of Genesis, where it's, you know, this dedication of this temple, this uh, sanctifying of a temple. Uh, then we have this covenant picture of agreement. Uh, we saw, uh, you know, we talked about the Suterrain Treaty and how this has similar uh, pictures to uh, similar correlation to that, uh, where it is a Suterrain Treaty for that matter. Uh, then we talked about the prophetic, how these texts, the days uh, are prophetic in regards to things we see in the New Testament. Uh, we talked about the covenant template, the, you know, the symbol package, that these, are these terms can be used to define or should be used to define things. Uh, the legal aspect, which as I listened to Dallas, that's why I'm saying this, um, as I listened to Dallas, I said, well, that's surely uh, in line of, of a more legal uh, perspective, this uh, uh, law, you know, uh, understanding of what's going on with the land and the, with the covenant. Um, we talk about historical, ancestral. Uh, so, you know, again, I believe that, you know, the healthy hermeneutic that we, we should maintain uh, is kind of looking at all these different aspects uh, and different responses, if you will, uh, to questions like that. You know, uh, what is the temple? What is, uh, who is Adam? What is Adam's role? I think there's a lot to say. You know, people sort of want to, I listened to a discussion recently where all it sounds like is Adam was supposed to create a political government. <laughs> and there you go. That's the story. And I'm like, well, no, there's a lot more to the story. Uh, so my point is, uh, I think that we need to uh, lean in a bit on those discussions. So um, I appreciate the question. Zach seemed to have had to run. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll hope to. Yeah. It's a great question because it brings us back to and pulls us a little bit out of that religious mindset of what's the text saying and brings us back to that reality of why is there a text? I think it was a great question. Amen. So, you know, for the sake of uh, our time and our discussion, I do want to bring us <laughs> further uh, in looking and talking about that text there in verse 25. Um, of course, if you don't mind, I'm just going to back us up to verse uh, 21, and then I'll read to 25. That sort of encapsulates what we talked about last time and moving into this verse. Uh, so the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God, by the way, this is the NASB. Sorry to jump in on the reading there. Uh, NASB translation. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a rib, uh, which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, you know, I must mention uh, here, before we get into our study uh, of this and talk about this, that thank you to all of you, because I can no longer read this without all these sort of prophetic things and thoughts and images popping into my head when I read just Genesis 2, 21 to 25. There's so much there, so many points and things that can be talked about. So I thank you all for that because, you know, Dallas, I know you're to, you're to thank and blame uh, for that at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and, and, uh, so all of you that bring up great points and, uh, you know, ask questions and consider these things. So thank you. Uh, so, yeah, let's get in on this discussion here. Uh, you know, Dallas, I'm intrigued to learn. I know you said you're kind of leaning in on this study anyway. Uh, so, you know, for me, if you, you remember, I mentioned last week that one of my ideas of this text is that this is speaking to an immature state 
you know, a newborn baby is the way Tim Martin has put it in his sermons. And, um, you know, I know that years ago, I can remember being rebuked that, you know, uh, the, the maturity is being clothed, according to the ancient understanding, clothed with Christ. Uh, so here we see this immature picture. So I know you had mentioned a bit different of a perspective, and I'm curious to hear uh, what you've been unearthing and how you might lead us into that study. All right, perfect, cool. So uh, first thing I'm going to point out is how it relates to the covenant template, because I think that helps us get a really good context, because I think for the most part, we're all in agreement that when we read uh, day one, we can all see the creation of light people now. Are, are we in agreement with that? Day one light people. I, I see let there be light and I follow, yes, first Thessalonians. And, and the basic logic, right? That if there's darkness on the waters and then he creates light, well, that's just a complete literary, you know, being parallel opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can surmise that when we read that and then we read, you know, you know Adam was formed and then it was talking about a nation and we can surmise day two is talking about a temple and it's creating a garden day three the covenant earth is being made and filled with the people of light and day four the light people are now filling the temple and getting jobs and orders being given to the temple day five the seas are filled day six the earth is filled and then the uh, dominion the governance is given to the light people so we see all those attributes taking place in adam being called out of the desert when the dry land was not yet producing he was put into the garden he was made covenant man and made the curse and blessings agreement uh, then we see the land animals being brought over to him to see about giving him a suitable helper he's given dominion with the woman which leads us up to this crescendo of the finishing of this whole thing where we have the priest, the priesthood, they're in perfect union with God, the covenant land is fruitful, all the systems that were just situated and put up are now functioning perfectly. We're at the beginning of perfection. No sin has been held, nothing wrong has taken place. So if we read that in then comparison to the covenant template, which lines up literally one after another because we just finished reading what god created man and woman day six gave him dominion over everything and literally we have day seven next well if we watch and follow it right in sequence the very next thing then the covenant template is now the heavens and earth were completed the heavens and earth were completed and all their hosts and god rested and called it good and entered into the no night so what we're reading here as a from the covenant template alone, it is telling us that when we get to the man and the woman being naked and unashamed, that means that God has established his covenant and it's functioning and working perfectly. No darkness so he can rest. And that to me is the perfect parallel to the Genesis 1 1, which is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then day seven is the completed perfect picture. When we read in Genesis 2, we see in the day that God created the heavens and the earth people in Adam. And in Genesis 2.25, they were naked and unashamed. The perfect picture of the system completed. Then immediately it changes. The epic of the creation of Eden is over. And now we move into the fall of Eden. So that's the end of that chapter. That's the end of that message that's the end of that word the end of that prophecy whatever you want so genesis 1 is the template genesis 2 is the first people created to that template which then leads us to the fall of that people which would be basically like a, a follow-up book like a part two to the first people so if we keep it in that order the man without going even comparing it to another scripture the man and woman both naked and not ashamed must be the created completed day seven kingdom with no darkness amen so that's just the concept so if you want to comment to that because i know that'll go against what you uh where you're at now mike i'd like to hear your because uh, you actually once believed i think very similarly to me right yeah yeah i you know and, and i still obviously you know it's hard to get rid of those preconceived notions you know i still i guess a lot of my understanding, and I agree, by the way, let me say that, Dallas, I think you said that very well, uh, you, you know, so a lot of my understanding comes more out of, I guess, 
the picture that becomes, you know, the the outworking of this story, the outworking of the narrative in scripture, uh, you know, and obviously, as I mentioned before, uh, the end all is that we're clothed with Christ, uh, naked and unashamed, you know, uh, almost seems like throwing off, you know, the necessary clothing. Uh, and then for me, that might wreak havoc on an interpretation. So, uh, or an application. So I guess that's kind of where I'm at in that. Uh, it sounds like to me, uh, like the questions you asked Vicky, which was where are you battling the uh, natural versus the prophetic language? It sounds like you're battling, well, where does the natural of this apply to the prophetic, applies to the metaphoric, apply, <laughs> I totally get it because we have to, where does it, and it does, it has to fit every one of those layers. So I totally hear where you're coming from. And so my understanding of what you had said, it, 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 what I've gathered, you know, in the summary, basically in the beginning, God had to intervene due to, you know, the chaos that was happening and the uselessness and the, the lack of knowledge of him. So he had to intervene. So he created the heavens and the earth, that system. And that system was completed in Adam and Eve uh, being naked and unashamed. And then after that, that was the completion, okay? Then after that was the fall, which led into a whole different, another direction because everything was perfect. And after the fall, you know, the curse had began. So restoration was needed that encompasses the rest of the scripture. And the re restoration doesn't come until revelation. You rather actually 70 AD. Well, and if we want to compare that to, oh, sorry. No, I'm finished. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Oh, okay. I, I, I was going to say, if you compare that to Israel, that's exactly the same thing that you're talking about. Because we get that Israel was pulled out of darkness. The covenant was established with them. And they were walking in perfection because at that starting point, which is interesting because like you said, and then it leads us to Revelation, it says right in Deuteronomy, as Moses is establishing the perfection of their covenant saying, this people are not gonna be good at this. <laughs> so it's interesting because what took place in Eden was perfection, well, the establishment of the kingdom, what took place in Israel, exactly the same thing, except when we got the Noah to replace Adam, it didn't fix it. But what we got with the Christ did, Amen. God Interesting point. I like that. I like that. God, God, God's intervention. You know, every time God intervenes, things get better. You know, till the ultimate. You know, when he when he gave his son. You know, and Jesus Christ. You know, being that fulfillment of all things, and then you know, bringing into judgment and and the rewards and all of the uh, everything pertaining to life and godliness. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, a big thing that I'm going to say that uh, is a troubling, a troubling I issue with uh, coming to grips with the, what does it mean to be naked and afraid, naked and unashamed, mm -hmm. is the answer comes in Genesis 3. So that's why it's really hard to go into depth about 225 when the answer for it's in the next chapter. So I don't know where you want to keep expounding on this, Mike, because I got a bunch of scriptures we can look at to compare to get an idea, because I do believe that if you read the scriptures in context, there's two major motifs throughout scripture. There's the motif of the culture and the motif of the covenant. And both of them have uh, the terms naked and shame, but they're used differently. Yeah, I could follow that. And I'm interested to go into that. I might just mention... Um, for me, and, and I maybe uh, I know Zach probably has some thoughts that he might want to jump in here and, and share. And then what we could do is we can conclude with, uh, you know, kind of a run through that. And we'll pick up after you talk, Dallas, we'll kind of end there and we'll pick up with uh, that study next week. I think it'll be a great precursor, if you will, uh, to uh, what we're what we'll do with Genesis three through four. However, if I might just say this for me, uh, you know, and, and I totally appreciate and I, I, I think what you're saying there, Dallas, may become clarifying to me. Um, you know, if we're follow, we follow this theme of an immaturity story, uh, what we see here is this child, Israel, created. And I know, again, a lot of my thoughts lean upon Tim Martin and his teachings uh, in this regard. And he's often brought up, you know, this is the picture of a newborn baby. He'll bring you over to, uh, you know, uh, Ezekiel 16, and you can see a picture of Israel there as a newborn baby. And this is a picture of immature Israel. 
uh, ultimately leading up to the necessity for a covering, which we know becomes the picture of atonement uh, and, and this picture now in the New Testament. And this is where it gets interesting because for me, I've often highlighted uh, atonement means to cover, propitiation means to throw off. Uh, so I've often highlighted that the true propitiating work of Christ is the throwing off of of the covering you know the need for the yes grace of god right so I, I get that's kind of where my thoughts have gone in many times now what i might say uh in maybe a follow-up thought to that where i where i'm currently at uh and kind of connecting that thought and maybe even allowing for a bit more liberty in the way i'm moving forward would be yes the religious need necessity for the clothing can be thrown off however the desire to be clothed you know, I don't wear clothing because I have to, I wear clothing because I want to, um, you, you know, that kind of idea can still be welcomed. And it seems like that might even lean in on what you're sharing there, Dallas, Dallas about the, uh, the distinction between the culture and the covenant. So I know I'm intrigued to kind of hear a bit further. Um, Zach, do you have any thoughts uh, pertaining to the, the naked and unash uh, not ashamed here uh, perspective that you, you want to exhaust right now or bring up or any questions before we move uh, on? Yeah. Um... And I have to say, like, I, I can see both sides of this, mm -hmm. you know, discussion, and um, I'm actually pretty sympathetic to both. Um, and I'm not sure we need an either or in this situation, but um, I've always been struck by what I see as sort of a um, prophetic reversal of this story in the life of Joseph. Um, and it's always something that I felt has given some level of clarity to what's going on in the story, at least um, within the context of the, the book of Genesis. And that's in Genesis 39, where we see um, what I think is sort of a strikingly similar storing being told but with a a different outcome which i think points ultimately to the work of jesus christ but in you know genesis 39 you have joseph being sold into slavery or by his brothers obviously and when he gets to egypt he is put into he finds his way into potiphar's house um and through the blessing of the Lord, he becomes essentially, you know, the he's given the authority of Potiphar's house because he's so, the Lord has blessed him so much in being able to run the household. Um, and he's given everything, Joseph says he's been given everything except Potiphar's wife. Um, everything in the household, but Potiphar's wife. And you know, we all, most of us are probably familiar with the story. Potiphar's wife um, gets the hots for Joseph and, um, you know, they're alone and Potiphar's wife uh, propositions Joseph and in a reversal of the temptation of Adam by Eve, Joseph refuses the temptation and in refusing it he runs away but he's unclothed in that encounter Potiphar's wife takes his garment and he's unclothed um but again in a picture of you know Christ that unclothing becomes what is used by Potiphar's wife to accuse him and um, he's ultimately condemned, although he's innocent in that situation, um, has not committed what he calls a sin in that situation. Um, now, I mean, the, you know, the picture of Joseph, Joseph as a symbol of Christ goes on um, to where he's put into prison, he's released, and ultimately he brings his brothers into, you know, a new a new promised land uh, in Egypt um, in this story. But I've always been struck by the parallels between this and 
the story of Genesis 2 and 3. And although I'm pretty sympathetic to Tim Martin's, you know, description of this being a, you know, the, 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 the childhood innocence of, of what's going on at the end of Genesis 2. I mean, for me, that sort of, the literary parallels, which I think are being made, sort of indicates that this is more of, of the innocence of sin and also, you know, the, 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 the true ruler who um, is, is free from, from sin. Yeah, I appreciate the way you said that, Zach. I appreciate the, you know, I can see both perspectives and, uh, you know, that's what, that's kind of the, the rabbinical understanding, if you will, of these things would be uh, kind of balancing between the both perspectives there and uh, allowing the outworking to be our hermeneutic. Um, you know, I'm curious to hear what everyone else has to say. That was just, you know, I appreciate what you said there, Zach. I think that's definitely one of the situations that has to be viewed and balanced and be part of the equation, absolutely. So Dallas, tell us. Uh -huh. what... Well, the one thing I want to point out as we get into this is the basic definition of the word naked, because this needs to be addressed because it's very, it's very easy for us to forget the realities behind these words and we want to religious, religify everything, so to speak. The word naked does not mean nude. Those are two different words. Nude means to have no clothing on. This is not talking about, you know, my genitalia. That's not what this is talking about. When it's talking about naked, the primary word usage of naked before our common day, so back in when it was being translated in King James and all those kind of things, naked, it was, a com it was used to reveal. It means to uncover, to show that which was once unable to be seen can now be seen. So we're not really comparing uh, the human body without clothes on as we are. We're seeing that as a motif of the human body without clothes on to shame. Mm -hmm. Why would there be shame in us being uncovered? Well, when we're uncovered, when we're revealed, that means I am not hiding myself from you. So if I was to stand before Mike Miano completely naked, that means all my bad, all the evil, everything that I've ever done is completely splayed out before you to judge me. So if I'm naked and unashamed, that means I can do that regardless. I don't care what you're going to do. I have, I'm in a position with you that I can do that. So that is presenting an image of relationship. And that's, that's what we're reading about, a man and a woman. We're talking about the most intimate relationship. So when it's talking about standing there naked and unashamed, it's not talking about two people being nude before one another and not giggling and laughing. This is talking about a covenant relationship between the two parties, and both of them are completely open in everything they're presenting, and they're coming towards it, and they're walking in it, and they're agreeing in it. And there is nothing that has brought shame upon that. Now, that motif is applied to the human body, which becomes a cultural reference. And now we even still today use this cultural reference. So if, uh, you know, you go to a party, a guy gets drunk and he strips naked and he's dancing at the party, the comment is he has no shame. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we associate not the nudity. We associate the heart behind why that nudity is there. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to understand about the metaphor versus the legalized use of it. Because the metaphor has always been. There's never been a time where people didn't know, you know, if the person had shame of their, you know, covering or not. In fact, we read in John uh, chapter three, Jesus explaining about how to enter into relationship with God. And how does he say it? He says in John 3, 17, that judgment has come into the world and that judgment is light. But men preferred the darkness over the light because their deeds were evil. And those who come to the light have their deeds exposed. So we see this battle of the shame covering up ourselves in darkness. Well, we read in Romans 1, Paul said, in 
since the creation of the world, which is Adam and Eve, the creation of the heavens and the earth, the covenant system, their entire world, he says, since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes of God have been clearly seen, but they gave that up. They gave up the glory of the incorruptible God, professing to be wise, because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they were shamed and put on the corrupted image of beasts because they followed creation, the serpent. So we see shame always being attached to the covenant issue because the shame, if we read now, just here we have naked and unashamed, day seven, no darkness, the very next chapter, Genesis three, we have the curse. And what is the curse? A result of Adam and Eve eating from the knowledge because they were foolish trying to become wise. They ate this knowledge. Then what happened? They knew they were naked. Mm -hmm. They now knew they did something they weren't supposed to do. They now have a stain upon the covenant. So they covered themselves up, just as Je Jesus said, light has come into the world. That was God in Genesis 1.1. It established Adam. Mm -hmm. But men preferred the darkness, and they immediately went and joined in union with the serpent. Mm -hmm. They preferred the darkness. Why? Because their deeds were evil. So they covered themselves because of their shame. And what does Adam say? God came walking in the garden and Adam said, I covered myself because I was afraid because of his shame. Mm -hmm. So here we are seeing a, a result of that is now the judgment of the curse. Mm -hmm. So now we're seeing a covenant association and we're seeing the cultural working out of it at the same time. This is like the, the spawning point because the curse now being applied to Adam is the degradation of the entire system of God. Mm -hmm. So because of that one blemish, that one mark, that perfect naked body has now a blemish and that blemish prevents perfect union with God. So that's the curse. They were now expelled as a result of that. But God wasn't just going to expel them and let them run away because this is his living man. So he gave him a covering so that he could come back into his presence to cover up that blemish. Yeah. So here we're seeing God not saying this covering is good. He's saying this covering is necessary in order for you to come back into my presence. So the previous state was better because they didn't need a covering. Mm -hmm. But now the covering is there to make it possible so that that could again join the two, although it's now not a perfect, naked and unashamed situation. So when we take a look at that, that's the foundation of the covenant. But that mm -hmm. covenant was already in the use of that motif of the natural naked body so they were already aware whoever wrote adam the story of adam was already using the natural motif of us having our nudity in front of people that we don't know is shameful mm -hmm. so it, the, the motif came before the covenant the covenant was written in that motif does that make sense yes i also see that with the with the prophets the prophets kind of being unashamed knowing that they, they that they were sinful but they were unashamed because they had god but yet when they proclaimed their message to the people you know the uh the leadership you know they felt their shame <laughs> but they they were covered in darkness you know and they preferred the darkness over the light and that's why they killed the prophets even up until jesus you know they preferred darkness instead of you know uh that uh where they could have been become unashamed or covered, you know, through Christ, you know, but they chose darkness and they killed them. And I want to point out what you said there. They were covered in darkness. Yes. covered. That's darkness. their covering. If we compare that to Psalms 35, 26, it says, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion, darkness, so let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor and dishonor that magnifies themselves against me. So here we're seeing that both the motif of the natural, but it's also being worked out in the covenant language. Let them be ashamed 
and brought to confusion. Let them be ashamed and brought to darkness. Together that rejoice at my hurting. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor. So here we're seeing dishonor and shame and confusion. And that's a type of clothing. But we also have another type of clothing, which is for who? That's not for me. It's not for you. This is talking to the Hebrews under the curse of Adam. The Hebrews under the curse of Adam need a covering because they're the ones who went into covenant and broke covenant. So in order for them, they now need a covering. Is that, so we got to make this distinction, but the language is useful. So like when we uh, read Psalms 132, 18, it says his enemies, I will clothe with shame. So man, the, the, oh, the co ahead. they're covering uh, without the remissions of sin, there could be rather without the shedding of blood, there could be no remissions of sin. So their covering was with their sacrifices and things of that nature. But then after 70 AD, you know, the temple went down, the, there was no need for that. And then Jesus Christ being that one and last and final sacrifice that was worthy to remove sin, uh, that's, that's all that was required. Exactly. And that changed then transformed the situation. And I like how Mike brought this up because it's super, super, super important. Sin for Israel became propitiated. You know, it didn't get put on the back burner. It didn't get, you know, forgotten. It got stricken from the record as though it had never been in the courts. So then why do I need a covering? The covering puts me in that position. But that makes my position naked and unashamed. Yes. And that's what this whole... You're jumping to the end, <laughs> but, but that's basically what it ends up being is so like Isaiah 20 verse four. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopians captive. So this is judgment according to the covenant. So shall the king of Assyria lead the Egyptian prisoners, the Ethiopians captive, the young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. This is not talking, he, he didn't take an entire bunch of, a couple nations and strip them nude. This has nothing to do with clothing being on or off, but rather this has to do with them not living up to the covenant status and have come under the judgment of God. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 3.25, we lie down in our shame and our confusion covers us. There's that darkness again. For we have sinned against the Lord. So here we have a direct reference to the shame of the covering being attributed to sin directly, not to the motif of growing up, but specifically now identifying we have two coverings, the covering of the shame from confusion and darkness from sin and the covering, which we're all familiar with, is the righteousness and glory of God given to us in Christ, which is the, as Revelation 3.18 is the selling point to the Hebrews in the first century, the Jews saying, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and have white raiment that you may be clothed and that thy shame of thy nakedness does not appear and anoint thine eyes with uh, eye slaw that you might see. So that's the selling point. That's if you're a salesman, Jesus is, that's his pitch. His pitch is, I will cover your sin, as Edward was saying. So you can go back to Adam and to the very first curse, which was the very first sin, which was death, which was taken out of the presence of God. And now you need a covering to come back in. Or you can come to realize now that Jesus has arrived. You don't need a covering, so to speak, like the law to make you acceptable. Jesus makes you acceptable. So that's a really important thing to see because there is the natural communication in scripture where it does talk about, you know, I was naked and you saw me and I don't like that. Amen. But there's, that's one of the natural living motifs. Revelation 16, 15 
Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. Because the atonement hasn't happened yet. The consummation hasn't happened. The redemption hasn't happened. The system coming down hasn't happened because they're walking through the transition. But in AD 70, they no longer needed the covering because the judgment took place and the end of the need to be covered because now your sin has been propitiated. It has been taken away. So there was a covering need covenantly. And that covenant uh, need is I want to be in the presence of God, but I am sinful. The only way for me to come in is if I'm, my sin is covered up. That was changed with Christ because we no longer need a covering to come before God because the covering has been done away with. There is no separation between God and man. Therefore, we can just come into his presence. And that's the core because we all know how do you come into the presence of God by accessing the truth and truth is the answer as we just finished saying because uh, what keeps us clothed is darkness, confusion, not trusting what God has said. When we trust in the righteousness of God, we come out of that and we are no longer ashamed of our dark deeds because we've clothed, clothed ourselves. The Hebrews had to clothe themselves with Christ. I know I'm lingering and I've got a bunch of different things here. I don't want to go too deep and I don't want to go too shallow, but I don't want to take up all the time also. So I'll leave it there for a minute and see uh, where we're sitting. Okay, I just basically wanted to comment on the propitiation and the atonement that Pastor had mentioned and that you had just described so well. As far as the uh, our sins being propitiated, cast out, cast away, where it's, it's like wiped from the record to where you know, we're uh, uh, naked and unashamed. But then to come into God's presence, we need to be clothed due to our, our sin nature, clothed in Christ Jesus, you know, though that, 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 uh, that white garment, that wedding garment, uh, that we're to uh, have covered. Uh, so that's basically what I see in that regard. Um, oh, that's the atonement, the uh, the covering. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That that's you couldn't have put that any more perfectly simple. I I got to start hiring you to thin out my videos. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now hire. Um, you know, again, and, and that's obviously always a, a part of our journey is, is wanting to simplify our truths for folks that are listening. And um, I appreciate it. I think it's the ethic of coming together like this that helps us do that. So thank you, Edward. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, Zach, did you have anything you wanted to jump in and say at this point? Uh, no, thanks. Cool. I just want to make sure I give open mics there to everyone. And, uh, you know, I want to let you know that we unmute the mics. I say that because, um, you know, there's a lot that can be said. Dallas is absolutely right. Uh, you know, and that's why I want to encourage you visit Better Understanding the Bible on YouTube. Dallas interacts with you on the comments. You can argue with him here on my programs. I just like nice thoughts. I want all my comments to be nice. Uh, so, uh, you know, I say that because I do welcome disagreement here. However, I know that an hour is a short amount of time to be able to get into a lot of these other details, important details. And I say that because my goal through this venue here has always been to welcome some disagreement, welcome different perspectives, and then highlight other resources for folks to study to show themselves approved. Uh, you know, you don't have to agree with me to relish the presence of God in your life. Uh, so uh, I encourage folks to just maintain that. And if God is saying, you know, to study a certain truth and maybe you're at disagreement with me, well, then go into your resources, do some digging. Uh, and, and be blessed by your proving all things. You, you know, so uh, I say that because I've welcomed, uh, I do want to mention here, I've welcomed those that disagree with us. You know, you might say young earth creationists, uh, those that disagree with this understanding of Genesis, I've welcomed them to be here. So, you know, and there's a lot of people that on social media that have a lot to say against my view uh, or things I've taught. And I always say, well, I have a our program that we host where you can bring your discussion there. They never show up. What they'll do is they'll show up when we begin to talk about something else and then tell us where we were wrong about Genesis. So I just want to let everyone know that, you know, that that's something I, my hope here is to welcome these thoughts, to give diversity of perspective, provide resources for people to go ahead and dig a bit deeper and to welcome disagreement where it is. And not to say that we're going to find the answer here. Uh, you know, I always think it's funny when we think that we can, uh, you know, solve 
uh, dilemmas that have been found in church history for centuries and then say that we're going to gather together on an online session and prove, you know, fix the problem. You know, come on now, folks. Uh, let's let's express humility here in what we do, you know. So, and I'm glad for all of you that you you do do that. And and you know, I know there's areas where we might say, well, that's not exactly how I would say that. Uh, but we we realize, you know, well, I'm going to have a forum to say it and, and to teach it. So, uh, thank you all, you know. And I say that because, you know, Dallas, uh, Edward, you both have blogs and opportunities to speak your your mind there. So, and I appreciate that you come here and you bless us uh, with your thoughts. So. Um, I say that also because I am going to move us closer to an end. And Dallas, I know that you're you're doing videos on this, so that's why I'm sending folks your way. Argue with him. Yeah. <laughs> well, and before you close up on that, let me just finish uh, th this thought here. I just got two scriptures to kind of because the whole point. I totally agree with you, and I think it was a great point. Is this show and these conversations are about moistening the mouth, getting you all salivating over the topic. And these two scriptures to me are a uh, nail in the coffin kind of scriptures that show us where, in my opinion, the significance of the, the garments comes in. Now, I am also not saying that the other interpretations are wrong. Now, there's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of things we can see into it. I am more focused personally on what is the intended meaning and to the relevant audience at the time. So personally, because that's my focus, that leaves out a lot of those more uh, non-direct ways of interpreting uh, methods. So that's why I'm not necessarily saying that like, so like the Beyond Creation Science books, we have a lot of different views on things because I think our purpose and what we're seeing and why we're seeing and what we're describing are different. So I'm not saying I'm right and they're wrong. I'm better and they're worse. What I'm saying is, and I agree with you, Mike, we need to have a place where all these views can be equally and faithfully looked at without fear of judgment and persecution for simply airing the idea. Mm -hmm. And you do a great, and I have to say this, I know I'm, I'm, this is just a side note. You do a great job of this. You bring in tons of people onto your show that you don't either agree with, agree with fully, or don't even understand where they're coming from just to give them time to speak. You're the only one I know that honestly opens floors to everyone. And you do so with an open heart and you do so with a non-judgmental mood and everything about it. And that's one of the big reasons why I felt so safe reaching out to you is you definitely do walk in a heart and compassion towards the church. And it's clear and evident. And I do give you praise for that god has put that in you and i see that glory it makes me think of how good god is for doing that in you so like yes that on a side note that's awesome and it's it's great that you brought it up because it is your heart so that's awesome thank you appreciate that glory to god now uh, the two scriptures i want to point out that are just those nail in the coffins from my view about how this is a covenant issue zechariah 3 4 and he said answered and spoke unto those that stood before him saying Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee in a change of raiment. So Zechariah is talking about, obviously, in this portion, the final judgment period, because we're talking about the end of the iniquity, which is attributed to the Messiah, obviously. And that's what this is about. The garments are about the removal of sin. It's not about the growth period. It's not about those things. So I don't see that in these scriptures that I'm pointing out, but I can see the motif of a growing relationship with God and man in this. But I don't necessarily think that that's what these scriptures are getting towards. And in 1 John 2, 28, I see that bringing us all the way back to Genesis 3. I do believe it's 3, 15, where it says, and God was walking in the cool of the day. and that is the coming of the Lord. And this might be weird to, for people to hear, but that's a parousia. That was the coming of the Lord in the garden. Well, in 1 John 2.28, we have the exact same event taking place, right? We have a new light being created, a new covenant man coming. We have the earth being established. And what do we have? We have God walking in the cool of the day. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord. 1 John 2.28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his parousia. 
So here we have the direct reference to what Jesus fixed with the covering was Adam was afraid and full of shame and hid. But now we're looking at the atonement sin being dealt with from Zechariah. And that means now the children of God can stand confident without that shame because the problem has been dealt with. So it's not a matter of growing up. It was a matter of redemption. They didn't need to grow up. They needed to be cleaned. So that, that, that's just obviously, like you said, we can't go exhaustively into these things, but hopefully these scriptures should Root, give you an idea. Grab a concordance. Drop naked and ashamed in there. And like I did that, and you know, you're going to realize there's some really interesting things. There are blocks of this one word being used by one prophet and that prophet only, and nobody else uses that word naked in that same context. Like it can get very confusing. <laughs> Amen. Well, I appreciate that, and I, and I definitely see you know what you're saying there, and I think. I think the healthy outworking of this is that there's probably, as I started with Genesis 1, uh, you know, probably quite a few different ideas that need to be filtered through and understood, especially, you know, uh, I do believe in a maturing story. And I would say that uh, when we understand the salvific nature of what God did with old covenant Israel, uh, this, when we're reading it, it's actually pre-covenant. And then we know the covenant is given, right, through the story of Moses there and then Israel's identity through the rest of the Old Testament. By the time we get to Jesus, there's a lot known that wasn't known when Genesis 1 uh, through 3 was written. So there's definitely maturing new details added to the story, uh, you know, and history for that matter, that in my opinion would change the outworking and let's say, dare I say, the need for clothing and what, what that might mean for um, not only Israel, but even those that are in that story. So uh, I think there's a lot that can be said. And, and I, I appreciate, Dallas, what you're doing there. And I look forward to uh, reviewing some of your resources and uh, continuing this conversation, maybe not in our fallback to Genesis. However, uh, who knows, we might end up doing a naked and unashamed and clothed conference uh, or something, you know, to kind of lean in on this topic. I think there's a lot that can really be said. So um, Dallas, I personally don't like this topic because it is too wide open. Yeah, like, uh, you can't argue most of these things. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. I, you know, personally, I, I like when we uh, can just keep the room open and, you know, we've all seen it like free form discussion where, you know, there doesn't need to be feedback. It could just be, well, this is kind of what I'm getting and this is what I'm getting. And then we can, you know, if I might say this, you know what, I'm going to end our, our segment here, our, our session today on this. Uh, this is actually part of my prayer before we even came, went live uh, with our session. So in the Preterist community, there's a lot of difference in regards to what we're saying about the kingdom of God. Right. There's a if you listen to the boroughs of Berea, uh, they had a roundtable they offered up uh, last Thursday. And uh, that was with Gary DeMar, Pastor Dave Curtis, um, quite a few other minds and hearts that were brought there for that session. And they talked about the kingdom of God. What's needed now that we know preterism is true. Right. You know, what do we need to do with it? And this has been a conversation. Uh, I mean, going back to that that book uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote. Right. Uh, well, how then shall we live? Uh, this is a conversation that continues. Uh, in Christianity, not just preterism. So now that we see it in the preterist community, uh, what I'm noticing is that there's people that, you know, again, it's the problem with every human movement, if you will, is we begin to say, well, this is the answer. This is what needs to be done. This is what we're saying has to happen. And that might be true, but that's not to the exclusion of other people that are saying, well, then no, this is what we need to do. Uh, you know, and I think I see the same thing happening here in Genesis is that there needs to be a more general conversation where, uh, you know, if I might express my thoughts, uh, I would, and I shared them on social media publicly, so I might as well. Um, when I listened to that roundtable discussion, I basically felt that, okay, so if I follow through with the preterist hermeneutic, it's going to lead me to see the need for conservative politics in my local church. Well, okay, that, that, that might be someone's view, and that might be very beneficial for some folks. Uh, however, to limit that and make that the kingdom of God, we are in trouble, folks. And, and, and that's my personal perspective. So I think the conversation can welcome that. And we can talk about that. And some folks that feel passionate in that area can make that happen. However, to limit that, you know, we all here, even in our small group here, we all have different areas of ministry in our own lives that we do and we walk in. 
and we're responsible to that. And I would not exclude, I would not sit here and say, well, that's not ministry or something, you know, uh, I think we need to be careful uh, in that regard. And we need to open up the door to, you, you know, the Pandora box, so to speak, in regards to what, how then shall we live and what shall we be doing? Uh, do not limit it to local politics and politics in the church and that, you know, we need to be uh, opposing abortion. Now, these things might be beautiful. However, to limit these things, to limit the kingdom of God to that is to limit what I read in Romans chapter 14, where it tells us the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And there's, again, as I, even just the small group here, we have a variety of ways we can go through each one of those terms and talk about how righteousness is needed, how uh, you know joy and, and, and peace in the Holy Spirit are needed in our lives and in the lives around us. So, you know, just a, a kind of a, a plea to our community to allow generality, allow these bigger conversations to not be you know, uh, divisive and say, oh, well, you know, now you have to go over there because you believe this. We can welcome different frames of thought. And I would encourage the same right here in Genesis when we're looking at this, you know, even as I, I we venture toward Genesis 3, there's going to be some uh, great points there that, you know, uh, stand out that I think we should hear each other out rather than limit our, you know, this is the way I'm looking at it and that's it. So there's my plea, uh, you know, Dallas, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the thoughts. And, you know, it's, I think what we're doing here uh, really does build up the mind and heart and help us lean in on these things to walk worthy of a seek, search, study, improve ethic. Uh, in regards to the scripture. So uh, I think you're leaning really hard on the test the scriptures yourself. And I think that's a very great foundational place to be is know why you believe what you believe, understand what you believe that you believe, and don't believe something just because someone else does. Right. You know, just because you disagree. There are, and I think this is what we fundamentally forget all the time in these awesome, great revelations we get, is that these aren't salvation issues. We all have put our red flags up. We've all stuck, you know, their flags on the ground saying, this is salvation. We want to be in the presence of God. That should actually take down a lot of defenses for these other doctrines. Like we're all talking about these things because we basically, as far as I know, we all came out of being wrong. None of us started right. We all started wrong. <laughs> so now that we've all come to a place where we can be much more solidified on the fact that we have salvation in God and these aren't salvation issues, I agree 100%. We should be a lot more graceful than on what are we. Look at the Reformation at the time of just bringing in justification through faith and how many denominations still exist from that. If we're going through something greater today, which I believe we are, we can have to be much more slow to judge, slow to ridicule, be patient, loving, take in things we'd otherwise don't even want to hear and realize, you know, we are in the midst of a reformation and we can do so with the padded gloves on or we can go to war with each other like happened in the medieval times. It's up to us. And I, I love it how you're doing it, Mike. I really do. Sorry to get gushy there, but you open the door. <laughs> we, we all see the big picture. And what's in the picture, we may see it differently and stuff like that, but it's in the picture. Hopefully we can see what's not in the picture to where that's not part of the uh, equation, but hopefully what we see is in the picture and that's what we would like to focus on. Amen. You know, I'm gonna uh, end our program here. I'm just gonna share some quick thoughts uh, to conclude. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I did wanna say, you know, we called it wandering the garden and sometimes being demanding of certain views is like saying the tulips are better than the daffodils and you know you're arguing over the the details in the garden so you know relax folks you, you know wander the garden a bit appreciate the truth seek search study improve uh, if i might just close out mentioning some reminders and resources uh tim martin teaches.wordpress.com we talked about god's garden that series there i encourage you to dive in we are uploading more and more uh sermons to that in the next couple of days better understanding the bible with dallas you've heard him here i want to encourage you find your way over there on youtube uh, be blessed by uh, his thoughts and he's obviously journeying a little further than where we are in some of these things and, and sharing his thoughts be blessed make your way over there burrowsofberea.com you have to check it out I, you'll be blessed by the conversation the humor that's brought forth and you might even listen to the preterist roundtable that i mentioned uh, that was released last thursday and uh, share your thoughts publicly. I know I would be willing to entertain that. Uh, we're actually working on a kingdom conference here at, in October 2023 at the Blue Point Bible Church. So 
Uh, my goal is to open up the general door for that conversation and talk about the kingdom of God and allow exhaustive thoughts to be shared uh, in regards to how we might live as uh, kingdom kings, how we might live as the people of the kingdom, and what kind of worldview are we manifesting, and are we limiting it? Uh, you know, if we are limiting it, then we need to realize, uh, is everybody saying that? And if we're not, then maybe we need to be careful uh, in that conversation. So uh, just some thoughts that, you know, I look forward to uh, bringing up. Um, the Kingdom Bible, I don't know the website just yet. I encourage you to go to Google, put in the Kingdom Bible online, and you'll be blessed by the commentaries there. Uh, I know they're still currently going through and updating the different commentaries and resources, but you will be blessed. By the way, one last announcement that I'm excited to share is uh, many of you probably listen to the Gary DeMar podcast. However, Gary has recently published a new podcast. It's uh, fresh off the press, so to speak. Um, I noticed on social media just moments ago, there's a new podcast you can find uh, on you know all the usual media outlets, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, and a couple others. Uh, he's doing a podcast called Covenant Hermeneutics and biblical eschatology. Sure sounds like what we're talking about here, doesn't it? Uh, you know, talking about Genesis, covenant hermeneutics on, on the Preterist Power Hour. I mean, that's biblical eschatology, folks. So I look forward to seeing what Gary brings forth. Uh, this is a, blog, a podcast between him or with him, not between, uh, with Gary and Kim Burgess. Uh, some of you may have been blessed by his thoughts in the past. Uh, he's a, a preterist teacher that I know I've been blessed by and have had correspondence with. So look forward to the podcast. Who knows if you pray and the prayers of the righteous man availeth much, uh, we might be able to get Gary DeMar and Kimber Guest to join with us here uh, on the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, you, you know, the, the prayers of this non-righteous man have not availed in that regard, but maybe your prayers might. I encourage you to do that. Uh, look forward to possible discussions with Gary and Kimber Guest. And um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Uh, I encourage you to keep wandering the garden with us. Just going to end on a scriptural note here. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, indeed, God, has God said, you shall not eat from the tree of the garden. And the woman said to her serpent, or said to the serpent, uh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, he said, you shall not eat from for from it or eat from it or touch it lest you die. Liar. God didn't say that. God said, don't eat. He didn't say anything about touching. Eve, why are you adding this to the equation? Many of you know, I often bring that up in my discussions of Genesis 3. I look forward to journeying there with you next week. Uh, we're going to look further into why is there a serpent in the garden talking to Eve? Where's Adam? You know, what is going on in this story here? And uh, I hope that we'll uh, add some meat to this understanding or your understanding of Genesis chapters one through three. Thank you for being here. Continue to wander the garden with us. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. God bless and go in peace. I look forward to talking with you Monday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern.